In this video, I'm going to show you how to hook up car stereo equipment inside of your home. This is the fourth video in a series where I show you how to build your own Bluetooth boombox. In the first two videos, I assembled the boombox, and in the third video, I showed you how to build a passive crossover network for the boombox. I'm going to give you a link to the playlist somewhere up here somewhere. In this video, we're going to get this thing hooked up, get it playing music, and show you some of the unique features of this boombox. The centerpiece of this project is an inexpensive digital media receiver. I only paid $12. They were so cheap that I picked up two of them. I figured I could use them somewhere. It turns out that hooking up car audio equipment in your home is not that hard. The main thing to remember is that your car operates on 12 volts DC, while your home operates on an AC signal running at 60 hertz. In the US, it'll operate at 120 volts, while in Europe, it's 240. You just need a safe way to convert your home current into a 12 volt DC signal. But more on that in a little bit, let's start off by examining the wiring we use in a car audio situation. Most aftermarket car stereo head units are going to use a standard color-coded wiring for speakers and power connections, and they typically have RCA-style preamp outputs. There may be as many as three pairs for front, rear, and subwoofer. This inexpensive model only has one pair of RCA preamp outputs. Let's take a close-up look at the wiring harness and take a look at the color-coded wires. The driver's side front is white, the passenger side front is gray, the driver's side rear is green, and the passenger side rear is purple. There are two wires of each color. One has a black stripe to indicate that it is the negative wire. And of course, you should always double check this with the owner's manual for the equipment. But if you don't have an owner's manual, most stereos follow this standard color coding scheme. I'm going to start by wiring my speaker outputs to the crossovers that I designed and built in a previous video. Careful to keep up with the color codes. Here I'm connecting the white wires from the harness to my tweeter crossover. I'm hooking the tweeters up on the front channel. More on this later. I know from the shot that it looks like I'm hooking up gray to white, but that's just due to the poor lighting. The standard wire harness is going to have a yellow 12 volt power wire, a black 12 volt ground wire, and a red wire that provides constant power to the radio in order to maintain internal memory. It'll also have a blue wire that's used to trigger an external amplifier and activate an active power antenna in a car. Always check your owner's manual since some manufacturers deviate slightly from the standard colors and modern equipment's going to include a lot more wires for things like cameras and steering wheel controls and a bunch of other features. Here I'm connecting the yellow power wire and the red memory wire to a longer red wire that I'm going to use to wire up my 12 volt power supply. The idea here is that the wires on the wiring harness just weren't quite long enough to get the job done, so I'm extending them so that I can make all of my connections. With everything wired up, the radio just slides into the mounting sleeve that came with the radio. Some people call this a cage mount. The cage just hooks to the front of the boom box with some tabs that you bend back. Then the radio slides right in. It should give you a nice click. Now we get to the part you wanted to see. Next, I simply strip the wire back and hook it up with a connector that came with the power supply that I'm using. I wasn't happy with the way this connector turned out because the connector did not do a good job of grabbing a hold of the bare wire. It wasn't a secure connection. Then I remembered I had a bunch of wire ferrules sitting in a drawer. You just slide the wire ferrule over the bare wire and use a special crimp tool to crimp it to the wire. These ferrules were a bit too long, so I just snipped off a little off the end, and now I've got a nice, secure connection. At this point in the build, I realized that I would like to hook up an external subwoofer, and I just happen to have one lying around, and I'll give you a link to the video where I put that subwoofer together. So I decided to buy some connectors so that I can make my RCA leads for this radio. My original plan was just to order some female to male RCA adapters, but I couldn't find any anywhere except for ones that were Y splitters. And I ended up just buying these connectors and making my own. Once again, I'm going to use wire ferrules on these so I can get a good solid sturdy connection. Now we get to the point where the rubber meets the road. The title of this video is how to hook up car audio in your home. And I'm going to show you how to do that right here and right now. So here I have the adapter that I plugged into the black and red wires on the back of this radio. And what I'm going to do is simply plug this into a 12 volt power supply. I bought this 12 volt power supply off of Amazon. I'm going to give you a link in the description below. And the basic idea here is I've got the yellow and the red wires hooked together 
and they go into an, another red wire and that gives us the positive on this then I got a black wire for the negative and then it's just simply a matter of taking this 12 volt uh, AC to DC power supply that I bought off Amazon and plugging it in it really is that simple and then you just simply take it and you plug it into the wall and there's the power cord for that now as I'm hooking the power cord up I want to give you some pointers here the first thing is this particular device is an 8 amp 12 volt power supply which is good for 96 watts but it came with a warning on it it said do not run this thing at more than 80 percent capacity and that's really important because what you've got to remember is that this thing cannot produce 96 watts of power. A lot of that power is going to get burned off as heat as it steps down from wall voltage down to 12 volts. And in fact, uh, there were even some commenters and reviewers on Amazon who said this thing was a fire hazard. More than likely, they were attempting to draw out a full 100 watts from this thing. Now, this little radio I have right now is not going to produce 100 watts of power. I'm nowhere near the upper limits of this thing. Here you see the blue light indicating that the power is on, which means we can just spin this thing around right now, and we can actually hit play, and we can play some music. But before we do that, there's a couple more things that I want to show you. What I have here is a 348 watt power supply. Now, once again, it's not going to give you a full 348 watts because it's going to burn off a lot of that energy as heat. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that in and you might be able to see some black and yellow wires right here. Now, these black and yellow wires are going to run up to a fuse block. Let me paint up real quick and show you that fuse block. And off of that fuse block, I can hook up pretty much anything that I want. And you can see on the right hand side of the fuse block some yellow and red wires. And there's also a, a black wire and that right there provides the power to my second Bluetooth audio receiver and the black and blue lines are 8 gauge power wire that I'm using for my test bench amplifier, the amplifier that's on my test bench. So let me pan over a little bit so you can see all of it right here. So there's the other uh, Bluetooth radio and on the left you can see my Kenwood amplifier. It's a yard sale amp that I paid 10 bucks for. It works great on my test bench. And so what I'm doing here is I'm using that power supply to run my test bench. I've got some terminal blocks right here so I can unscrew and hook up pretty much any speaker that I want to test. Now you can find YouTube videos explaining how you can use a computer's power supply in order to run 12 volt in your home. I don't recommend doing this. I would much rather go ahead and buy a power supply that was intended for this, like this particular power supply right here. I'm going to go ahead and give you a link to it in the description and I want you to remember one key thing about this. Yes, this is a 348 watt power supply. No, it will not provide enough juice to run a 348 watt amplifier. You don't want to push these things to their extreme limit because these things are also going to burn off a lot of that power as heat. So keep that in mind whenever you want to hook up a car stereo in the home. The adapter that you use to get your 12 volt power simply cannot keep up with what you think it can keep up with. Now it's time to play some music. I'm going to run some pink noise through this thing. I want to show you one of the features that, that I designed. I'm going to go in, I'm going to find the fader, and I'm going to fade this thing all the way to the front. And as you can see, as I fade it to the front, I lose a lot of the lower frequencies here, and I'm left with just a really high treble, 2000 hertz and above, coming from those tiny little air motion transformer tweeters. This is by design. I deliberately set it up so that I could do this by putting the tweeters on the front channel and the mid-ranges on the rear channel. And as I run the fader back all the way to the rear right here, you can see that I lose a lot of that treble. And this gives me the ability to, in essence, use the fader control as a tone control. And as you can see, I've got it all the way to the back, and when I put it all the way to the back, I lose the really high-end frequencies. I can go in also, and I can tinker around with the equalizer here and as I play with the equalizer I didn't see a lot of change on the on the spectrum analyzer just so you know what I'm doing here is I've got a calibrated microphone plugged into a cell phone and I'm recording it with another cell phone you know how it is you get tons of old cell phones laying around and so the inbuilt equalizer I didn't see a difference on the spectrum analyzer one thing I want to point out is around 2000 3000 Hertz I've got a dip uh, that dip is just a side effect of the crossover that I have designed. I could have gotten rid of that dip in the crossover setup. In fact, when I designed the crossover, the software that I used predicted the dip right there. 
oh, here I'm fading all the way to the rear, and you can see the dip, and I'm going to fade it to the front. And looking at the spectrum analyzer, what I found was fading to the front by two gave me the most even sound across the frequencies that this can produce. And that's really handy. Like I said, I can use the fader as an equalizer, and that's a really neat feature. I've got some YouTube approved music all queued up. Let's play some tunes through this thing. I don't know how well you can hear it on YouTube, but it sounds pretty good. It's a lot of fun to turn the fader all the way to the front to hear just those air motion transformers playing. There's this weird kind of thunk, thunk, thunk sound with this particular song, and I'm not sure where that's coming from, but it doesn't sound particularly good on this particular track. But overall, I'm pretty happy with this project. It was a lot of work and a lot of fun to build it, and my hope is that you enjoyed this build as well. And my hope is that you'll go ahead and hit subscribe and watch the whole playlist and check out everything that I put together here. Now I've also got the ability to add a subwoofer to this with my RCA outputs. Haven't done that yet. I'm going to get around to that eventually. And I hope I get a chance to show you in a video what I did. Thank you so much for watching. Come back and see me next time.